If the art of the politically possible doesn't match up to what the overwhelming majority of climate scientists say must be done, what will be the impact on the global economy? Nature Inc, now on BBC World News. We have now stringent observations which provide us a robust picture of a warming climate, of a warming planet in almost all regions. Without some kind of price on greenhouse gas emissions, markets are giving the wrong signals. They're failing. And indeed, I did once describe it, I think uh, perfectly reasonably, as the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. No, there's no need to bother about cutting emissions, and it is not going to happen. I give you a prediction that it will not happen. In June 2009, 7,000 delegates from around the world gathered in Bonn to try to agree a negotiating text for what has been billed the most important meeting for the future of the planet, the Copenhagen Climate Summit, taking place in December. The world's leaders face a simple question. In order to avoid the worst impact of climate change, how deeply are they prepared to cut CO2 emissions? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a group comprising 2,500 of the world's top climatologists, has concluded that human activity has pushed atmospheric CO2 to dangerously high levels. Scientists have outlined how animal and plant life would be severely affected, but the consequences for the global economy have been less well understood. Many dire economic predictions had been made, but it took Lord Nicholas Stern, a dispassionate and unassuming ex-British Treasury and World Bank economist to get science and economics on the same page. The Stern Report of 2006, commissioned by the Tony Blair government, was the first to put a price on failing to tackle the causes of a warming planet. This is the most important report on the future published by this government in its time in office. According to Stern, 2% of world GDP needs to be spent on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Failure to act now, says Stern, means that in 50 years time, we could be faced with bills 10 times that amount and runaway climate change. This time on Nature Inc, we examine the economic cost of climate change. We report on a country that has taken renewable energy seriously while maintaining growth and discover that nature is having the biggest economic impact of all on climate. I'm doing that. If we fail to manage climate change, we will see by the end of this century or the beginning of next, probably temperatures of four, five, six degrees centigrade. That would involve huge disruption in the physical geography of the world. Some areas would uh, turn into deserts. Other areas would be flooded. Other areas would be battered by hurricanes. Some rivers would see their courses change. Sea levels would rise. Coastlines would change. Nicholas Stern's warning is stark and his economic analysis is straightforward. Without early action on climate change, we risk paying a much higher price not so very far down the road. And some of the cost is likely to fall on developing countries, which are least able to pay. The UNDP has done a very useful uh, calculation where it argued that the costs uh, to developing countries of trying to meet their development goals would be around 85 billion per annum dollars compared with uh, what might have been the cost if the climate had stayed more stable. Stern estimates a single tonne of CO2 going into the atmosphere causes damages worth at least $85. There are 70 million tonnes going up each day and no one is paying the price. Stern argues that market forces have been skewed. When we deprive other people of labour because it's used to make a shirt we pay for it and we think that's normal and we and it's right because what the market is doing is giving an indication of scarcity it's giving an indication of the cost of production and markets should reflect 
the cost of producing something. Without some kind of price on greenhouse gas emissions, markets are giving the wrong signals. They're failing. And indeed, I did once describe it, I think uh, perfectly reasonably, as the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. Stern argues that this market failure is best reversed by taxing emissions. We, we don't give up markets because of market failure. Markets are very important. The challenge then is to get them to work well. So that means a price for greenhouse gases. How much would that price or tax on carbon be? It might be 50, perhaps a bit more, dollars a tonne of CO2. How would that translate into increases in prices of gasoline? It might involve something like uh, 40 US cents a gallon. It's a significant cost, but it's the kind of cost that we should be able to adjust to. And Stern sees potential benefits. Taxation, together with energy efficiency measures and new technologies, could shift the world onto a low carbon path. He estimates this could eventually boost the world economy by $2.5 trillion a year. However, not everyone agrees with Stern's figures. Nigel Lawson, finance minister under Margaret Thatcher, is one such person. The great majority of the economics profession have come out and said that uh, his economics, the economics of the Stern Review, is plain wrong. Critics argue that Stern overestimates the real costs of dealing with climate change. Rather than paying to reduce emissions now, it may be more cost effective to pay for adaptation to the effects of climate change as and when they arise. We adapt to it. That's what people do. That's what people always have done. That's much more cost effective. And for the poorest countries of the world who can't afford the adaptation, you give them overseas aid to enable them to adapt. And that is perfectly plausible, perfectly sensible. Stern agrees adaptation does have value. We will have to adapt to climate change and we'll have to adapt more if there's more climate change and we can influence through our actions, through our missions, how much climate change there will be. So in looking at those kinds of decisions, how much to cut back, how much to spend on adaptation, one has to take a view on what are the risks that you're avoiding in terms of the economics of those risks. Decisions on how much money should be spent to avert climate change will be central to the climate meeting taking place in Denmark's capital, Copenhagen, this December. One long-held view is that any country moving to a low-carbon economy will lose out to other countries who continue their fossil fuel guzzling ways. <laughs> to test this, Nature Inc. went to the country that will be host to the conference to find out if policies brazenly favouring non-polluting energy had held back the economy. Connie Hedegaard is Denmark's Minister for Climate and Energy. She's in no doubt that Denmark's policies have helped rather than hindered the economy. We focused for 30 years on energy efficiency and on renewables. And there is a huge public support for, for, the, for a number of reasons. One of them being that it's creating a lot of jobs. So actually today, renewable and energy efficient technologies will be one of our fastest growing export areas. When the 1970s oil crisis struck, Denmark was 99% dependent on oil from the Middle East for all its energy needs. Today, almost four decades later, Denmark is the only EU nation to be energy self-sufficient. And it's not all down to North Sea oil either. Denmark has the highest proportion of electricity generation produced from renewable sources in Europe, almost 30%. And it's wind power that's responsible for the lion's share. The boom in wind has brought jobs to over 20,000. Almost half of all the wind turbines in the world are manufactured by Danish companies. Public support has been critical. It has to be. The Danes have among the world's highest taxes. But the high tax base has enabled successive governments since 1973 to provide the financial backing to help develop renewable energy technologies. It has been heavily subsidised over the years and, and really I think there's common uh, acknowledgement today that the reason we have such a strong industry today simply is that the government was need at the time. It's not sort of a partisan issue, it's across party lines. 
On the Danish island of Samso, the island's 4,000 plus population have gone one step further. Here, all the islanders' electricity and heating comes from renewable energy. Even the cars and tractors are now being modified to use rapeseed oil for fuel. And it's good in salads too. The project cost the islanders 54 million euros, with 4 million euros in public subsidies. The key to making this work lay in involving the whole community. You cannot do it without them. You need to be attached to, for example, wind turbines. They have to be there for a reason, and if they are not, I mean, people will object to them and say, why do they disturb my view? The islanders are now shareholders in the renewable energy business, so they get paid when excess power is sold back to the mainland. Some are directly investors and some are a part of a community project. And, and every, every, every person on this island is, is having a profit from this investment. 